After having seen now how multi-head attention is implemented, we can take a closer look at the transformer architecture in particular. So the transformer architecture is built up of a sequence of multi-head attentions, similar like a ResNet is built up with um, multiple ResNet blocks in sequence. However, the original transformer architecture, as presented down here, had an encoder and decoder part. What does that mean? So originally, the task has been machine translation. You get the input se uh, sequence as a sentence. You want to analyze the sentence, which goes through the encoder. And then you push that information to the decoder to generate the new translated sentence. This decoder is then auto-regressive, like the LSDM you implement in assignment 2 for question 2. So it basically predicts then one word by the next one. Well, the encoder really looks at everything uh, of the input sentence, analyzes it, so it's ready for translation. We will focus here mostly on the encoder block because of the task we will choose, which we'll see lower and actually more. the encoder is also one of the main parts of the transformer architecture which is currently used. So the encoder you can see here is built out of multiple parts. We take input embeddings, so basically if we have words, uh, we would first put them into embeddings, right, to have a dense representation. We'll look in a bit about positional encoding. Um, we will then push that through a multi-head attention block. However, we have these residual connections that add the output to the original input and perform the layer normalization. Why is this residual block important? Of course, for example, also in ResNet, um, transformers are very deep, and therefore residual connections help us with the uh, flow of information. However, there's a much more important reason in transformer architectures, namely that otherwise the information of the word itself is lost. Because you can see that actually um, we compare each word with each other in the attention, right? And also we uh, compare the query and the key of itself. And there's no reason why the network would have a higher attention to the key and the query. And also after the layer, it doesn't know which feature the original word actually had compared to all the others. So actually, if you do it after initialization, run a transformer without residual connections, it cannot distinguish between which features actually came from which word, and therefore the output will be all the same. So basically one big average if you don't do residual connections. Afterwards, you apply a feedforward network. So this is a very small MLP, it's actually white. So you increase the hidden dimensionality. Um, why is that? So this is chosen in contrast to a deeper uh, MLP because it's just faster to run. Like if you have big GPUs, that is something which is faster than to run. And this, we, this block we just repeat n times so that we get a full uh, transformer architecture. If we now um, look at the code below, so this is nothing else we've seen. We each block, so this is the encoder block, as a multi-head attention block, has the MLP down here, and when to layer normalization and dropout applied on the residual connections for some regularization. Then the transformer architecture is nothing else than a list of encoder blocks that we apply one by one. I implemented here also one more function, get attention maps. What does this do? It's basically a function which will return us the attention probabilities uh, for each head and for each layer. Uh, this will be helpful if we want to visualize the attention. Because attention can be often used to at least get the intuition of what the model is doing. Because if a model is attending a lot to one word, you might be able to say, okay, this word seems to be very important. However, there's a big discussion in research whether explanation is attention or, ex um, or attention is explanation or not. And there are two also fun papers like attention is not explanation and then a follow-up attention is not not explanation. So there's still, it, you can use it as explanation, but you should not rely on it. Next, we will look at the positional encoding in the transformer. So the positional encoding in transformers is the part you have seen in uh, the architecture up here, namely this thing which is added to the input embeddings of the words. So what is that? If you remember, multi-head attention cannot distinguish between positions in words. 
However, in language, this can be important. Um, and therefore, we should also add this information. So if a word comes before another one, and so on. In transformer, this can be done by just adding a signal to, um, to the inputs. So basically, we add just a few input features saying, OK, this input comes from position 1, this position 2, 3, 4, and so on. And then the model can learn itself if the positions are relevant or not. You could just use another embedding that you learn to represent uh, the features for the position. However, that's not very good if you have uh, very long sequences in the test set, for which you probably haven't seen uh, specific positions. Like if you have a sentence suddenly with 500 words, uh, but in, in the training set you have only seen uh, sentences with 200, and you don't have any embeddings for these positions 201, 2, 3, and so on, up to 500. The better way is to use a signal which you could generalize to uh, further uh, positions, and the one that you see in the tension or in the transformer paper is cosine and sine waves. So uh, we have here a formula which might look a bit complicated. This is why we can directly just look at what it's nothing else doing. So uh, up here is a visualization of a hidden dimensionality of our positions in sequence. So for example, I have what is here, I think, 96 words. And each word is now represented with a feature vector of 48 or even longer. So basically, if it's longer, it just adds down here, but the signal doesn't change. And what we do is we apply this kind of feature map. So each word in a position will get here different changes, which are identified with zeros and ones and minus ones. And these changes, the signal, are nothing else than sine waves, which go over the position. So this is what is shown below here. The first hidden dimensionality over the positions, we will add this sine wave. So for the first word, the first hidden dimensionality will be not changed. For the second word, the first hidden dimensionality will be added one, and so on. So this way we add the sine wave to our features. The second hidden dimensionality gets just the cosine wave, so basically the sine shifted by one. Um, and then you see that the hidden dimensionality B and 4 will get now uh, signals which have longer uh, wavelengths. So here you see this have quite a short wavelength, while here we just increase the wavelength now over hidden dimensionalities. And this is why you see here for the first hidden dimensionalities a big change all the time, while then later it really smooths out. What is the advantage of using these sine waves instead of just a random uh, signal we want, um, it is that you can easily calculate the distance between two words. So with a linear operation, you can actually say how far two, um, yeah, two words are apart because of these sine waves. They repeat periodically, but we have here multiple wavelengths up to a wavelength of 10,000 um, times 2 pi, and therefore you can really distinguish any two words in the sequence, which helps the transformer to actually learn it while the signal just uh, generalizes for longer sequences. That's why it is used here. Another interesting optimization issue in transformers that you should be aware of is learning rate warm-up. So learning rate warm-up means that we want to increase the learning rate of the first steps. Why is that? So uh, there has been a lot of work in actually comparing different optimizers on transformer. And a plot up here, you see on a uh, standard training objective, where the blue line is if you would apply standard add-in. And there you see it actually fails to optimize the model. So it stays up here with a very high loss. While well, if you do a small tricks, like here called add-in warm-up, you see that it actually goes down very nicely and achieves a much lower training loss. Why is that? Um, so there are multiple reasons that people are right now still discussing in research. One can be that uh, Adam has these uh, bias correction factors, right? So that in the beginning of a training, you weight up higher the adaptive learning rate and momentum to uh, encounter that you haven't seen any batches before. And this can be actually causing a lot of noise, which therefore pushes your model, model's parameter to a wrong direction. This is, for example, when you can use different optimizers like Radin 
which overcomes this uh, issue. Alternatively, uh, another explanation is because of the layer normalization. So you see we have multiple layer normalizations in the network, and you can show that the output gradients, so the gradients for the output layer, which will be also propagated, are independent of the number of layers we actually have in the network, and this can cause, again, issues for very deep transformers. And therefore, there are also alternatives, like pre-layer normalization S, uh, which is basically moving this layer normalization inside the residual block, similar as pre-activation no um, where SNETs put the activation function inside the uh, activation block. However, um, often learning rate warm-up is used because it's a very simple way to overcome the issue of this pre-mature convergence. What is a warm up exactly. Let's just look at. So I define up here a scheduler, a learning rate scheduler with warm up, and the warm up are these first hundred iterations. So I gradually increase my learning rate from zero to one, or basically the learning rate I want to have, and then I start my usual uh, scheduler. Here, a very common scheduler for transformers is the cosine scheduler, so that you have a cosine wave which slowly converges the learning rate to zero uh, at the end of your training. That is just another learning rate scheduler I wanted to show you. You can of course also use it with here exponential decay or whatever you prefer. Finally down here, um, I just take the whole transform architecture and put it in a PyTorch lighting module. So that is nothing surprising, therefore I will also skip it here. Um, I just have it as a template so we can define afterwards our own, uh, when I have it down here, our own training step, validation step and test step for the specific um, task we will look at.